welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. Today we have Sarah Markovich. She is a PGY1 pharmacy resident at St. Luke's University Health Network, and she will be presenting a journal club on Is There a Connect a Place in Therapy? Journal Club. Thank you. Before we begin, I would like to say that I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. And there are three main objectives that I would like to cover today. The first is discussing the available knowledge regarding tenecteplase and its use in acute ischemic stroke treatment, then examining this study's procedures, results, and summarizing conclusions into an applicability to practice and what thoughts we have. For the background, tenecteplase, or TNK, is a type of tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, agent. TPAs work by binding to fibrin and then converting plasminogen to plasmin, which would then break down fibrin into degradation products and then dissolve the clot. The 2019 AHA guidelines for early management of acute ischemic stroke recommend alteplase be given within four and a half hours of symptom onset. Specifically, I want to talk about this window and why it's important. Looking at the ECAS trial, Atlantis, NINS, and Epithet trials, there's a pooled analysis that shows that administration beyond this four and a half hour mark showed a reduction in short-term survivability without significant outcomes benefits. And so that's why the window was set at zero to four and a half hours from a symptom onset. Tenecteplase and alteplase, both being TPA agents, are very similar. However, there are some notable differences that I would like to discuss. The first being t- tenecteplase has a longer half-life of 90 to 130 minutes versus alteplase is 72 minutes. And this is important because it allows for a easier administration, a push dose over about five seconds versus alteplase requiring a continuous infusion. Additionally, tenecteplase has a higher specificity for fibrin binding and then increased resistance to inactivation by endogenous PAI or plasminogen activator inhibitor. Currently, tenecteplase does not have FDA approval for acute ischemic stroke, but it is used in many institutions, St. Luke's included, for this indication. Looking at previous literature, there are two main trials that I wanted to discuss and set up what brought us to the TRACE-3 trial that we'll discuss today. The first is EXTEND, which happened in 2019. It is a multi-center, double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial that occurred in Australia, New Zealand, Finland, Taiwan. It looked at the administration of alteplase versus placebo in the four and a half to nine hour symptom onset window. 225 adults who were baseline functionally independent with salvageable brain tissue were enrolled. They did not meet their goal of 310. And for their primary outcome, looking at functional independence at day 90, they found a significant difference between groups for the adjusted risk ratio, but not for the unadjusted. Mortality was not found to be different between groups, and there were significantly more intracranial hemorrhage events in the alteplase group than in the placebo group. Talking about this trial was important because the results of the TRACE-3 trial we'll discuss today would build upon this extended window and then also using a drug that is generally easier to administer. The timeless trial in 2024 was another randomized placebo-controlled blinded trial that took place in many sites across the U.S. and Canada. They enrolled 458 adults who were also baseline functionally independent with salvageable brain tissue to either TNK or placebo. And their primary outcome was not looking at the number of people who achieved that functional independence score, but rather the distribution of modified rank and scale scores. And we will touch on the modified rank and scale and go over in detail in just a couple slides. But I wanted to note that there was not a significant difference there. Both groups had a median score of three. Mortality was similar between groups, and intracranial hemorrhage events were also similar between groups. This study had 77.3% of patients undergo thrombectomy, which limits its applicability in patients where thrombectomy is not available, which is what the TRACE-3 trial looked at, specifically those populations who did not have that access. So that's how our trial today builds upon the existing lift. Looking at this trial, its purpose was to connect to place use in that extended window presentation after their last known well time. It is a multi-center prospective randomized trial. It was open label to patients and treating clinicians. However, outcomes assessors 
the people who were evaluating the outcomes of the patients in the trial did not have access to see what group that they were assigned to. So it was blinded in that regard. They were either assigned to nectoplase, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, up to 25 milligrams per dose, or they were assigned to standard treatment. Standard medical treatment did conform to the 2018 Chinese guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of acute ischemic stroke, which were very similar to the 2019 AHA guidelines I had mentioned previously, especially in regards to the antiplatelet therapy for the standard medical treatment and also the contraindications to the thrombolytic agents. Recongen Pharmaceutical is the study funder and also the manufacturer of Tenecteplase. They provided an unrestricted grant to support infrastructure. However, they did not participate in design, conduct of the trial. They could not delay or prevent the publication, and they had no involvement in the drafting of the manuscript. So we talked about the modified Rankin scale, and now I really wanted to take an opportunity to break it down and look at its component parts. It is a zero to six scale that assesses the incidence of disability. So zero would be no symptoms, one would be no significant disability, and then it would increase in disability burden all the way up to six being deaf. So the primary outcome for our trial is going to be a score of zero or one on the modified ranking scale at day 90. Our secondary outcome will look at what they defined to be functional independence, which is a score of two or less on the modified Rankin scale. We will also be assessing major neurological improvement at 72 hours, which was defined as a reduction of at least eight points from baseline on the NIHSS score, reperfusion at 24 hours, and then overall change in that NIHSS score at seven days. For safety outcomes, they will be assessing symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage within 36 hours of randomization, mortality at 90 days, and then any bleeding events or otherwise uh, adverse events. Patients were included if this in this trial if they were at least 18 years of age, presenting with acute ischemic stroke symptoms in that four and a half to 24 hour window. They also needed a pre-stroke modified Rankin scale score of zero or one at baseline, and they needed a baseline NIHSS score of six to 25 pre-stroke. They also required imaging to confirm that a single large vessel occlusion was the, responsible for the ischemic stroke symptoms, specifically the internal carotid artery or the first or second segment of the middle cerebral artery. And then they required evidence of salvageable brain tissue was identified by a software that they had looking at ischemic core volume and mismatch ratio. They used eye stroke and we'll talk about the software that they use and its implications a little bit later as well. Patients were excluded in this trial if at the time of randomization they had a planned endovascular thrombectomy, if they met any guideline-based contraindications. These, like I said, were similar to the 2019 AHA guidelines presenting their contraindications, such as platelets being less than 100,000 or acute ischemic stroke within three months. Both guidelines had those same contraindications. Also, if they received the thrombolytic agent at an external hospital, if they were not able to perform the imaging studies, or if they did not obtain consent, they were excluded from this trial. The primary outcome was assessed using the cochrane mansell hensel test, which is an estimate of association between an exposure and an outcome. They also had pre-specified subgroups for their primary outcome. They looked at age, sex, baseline, NAHSS score, time of symptom onset, and then the site of occlusion. Qualitative categorical data was, was assessed using chi-square or Fisher's exact. Qualitative rank data was assessed using the Wilcox and rank sum test or the Man whitney u test. And then quantitative data is, was assessed using the paired t-test and rank sum test as appropriate. All confidence intervals reported were 95% and significant p-values were less than 0 0.05. So looking at the patient screen, 1,469 were screened and 516 were randomized. Of these randomized patients, it allowed them to achieve a power of 80% they set out to achieve. 264 were randomized to the tenecteplase group, 252 to the standard treatment group. These groups were both similar at baseline. As a study as a whole for the population, I wanted to go over some things that I found interesting. First, talking about onset of stroke and where they fell into that category. The known onset time occurred in 57% of trial participants overall, followed by wake-up stroke at 36% and an unwitnessed or unknown onset time of 7%. Additionally, salvageable brain tissue imaging occurred in 88.6% of patients by CT mechanism, and then perfusion-diffusion MRI was done in 11.4% of patients. 
Our primary outcome, having that low score on the modified ranking scale at 90 days, was found to be significantly different between groups, um, more so in the tenecteplase group at 33% occurrence, and then 24.2% in the standard medical treatment group. Additionally, I would like to take this time to just discuss briefly the subgroup analysis. The only significant outcome they found was that males favored tenecteplase. But looking at the breakdown of that primary outcome of those rank and scale scores at 90 days, the distribution was not found to be significantly different between groups. However, before we move on to the next slide and I show you the table, I wanted to take a moment on this graph to point out that there is a 10%, 10.2% difference between tenecteplase and standard medical treatment in the two or less category, which if you look on the second line of this chart is a significant outcome, major neurologic improvement at 72 hours, reperfusion at 24 hours, and change in NIHSS score at seven days were also found to be significant. And none of the safety outcomes they looked at were found to be a significant difference. The authors concluded that administration of tenecteplase in this time window did improve disability-free recovery in patients with a large vessel occlusion and salvageable brain tissue, which allowed a larger population of patients to benefit from this therapy by extending that treatment window. Also, they found that because of this efficacy, tenecteplase will streamline administration to patients, making it easier to give them this medication than it would alteplase. But they pointed out that it requires corroboration in other countries. This is because the study was done in China, and they pointed out that the ideologies of strokes and the disease burdens were a little bit different between countries. So, for example, intracranial atherosclerosis was found to be more prevalent in China versus atrial fibrillation, which was found to be more prevalent in the Western Hemisphere. Like all studies, there are strengths and limitations, but I found that the blinded outcome assessment was one of the strongest points of this trial. It controlled for that or identified open label limitation, but it also kept patient safety at the forefront, knowing the risk of tenecteplase as a medication and the events that can come from it, making sure that the treatment team knew how to appropriately and quickly treat the patient was very important. So I liked that they did that to not jeopardize the data and also treat patients appropriately did meet power for their primary analysis. It was found to be significant, but they didn't know that at the start. So it was nice to see that they were able to set a goal for how many they wanted to enroll and then achieve that goal. I also found that it had a large applicability to rural areas that may not have access to thrombectomy. I know that is the case for many sites in my own network, as well as many sites across the country. So I feel like this would be a really good trial to use in those sites and apply that these results where thrombectomy is not available. On the other hand, more urban areas or more city-centered hospitals that do have thrombectomy availability, this may not be as applicable there because thrombectomy is an effective treatment in and of itself. Additionally, when talking about the software, the software they use was called the iStroke software. It was created in China and found to be very comparable to FDA-approved software assessing the perfusion of ischemic stroke lesions. The name of the FDA-approved software is called RAPID, and both of these are looking at perfusion-disfusion mismatch, so the difference in hypoperfused tissue and the volume of the lesion, to identify how much of that tissue is still able to be reperfused and gain brain function, function back. So this software is not widely distributed yet, but this study could potentially be used to endorse the purchase of said software by those institutions who don't have thrombectomy to help these patients in the extended window. And of course, the location of study sites was a limitation just for the external validity in application to the United States where we are practicing. Looking at the secondary and safety outcomes, they were not adjusted for multiplicity. The study was not aimed to detect these differences, so the power was not set for these outcomes. And when multiplicity is not adjusted for, it increases the risk of a type 1 error or a false positive, which makes me think of those secondary outcomes that were found to be significant. And not meeting power increases the risk of a type two error or a false negative, which makes me think of the safety outcomes that were not found to be significant. So final thoughts and some key takeaways that I wanted to leave you with is that I believe this the results of this trial are promising for a larger population of patients as many patients do present outside of this four and a half hour window. So this would create another effective treatment option for them. Also, many institutions use tenecteplase rather than alteplase, including St. Luke's, for its ease of administration being one strong point for it. And this adds to the wealth of evidence saying that tenecteplase is effective here. So this can help potentially further streamline patient care in more areas across the country. And uh, as I mentioned on the previous slides, 
the availability of this software, if it's not already in their hospital, this study can be used as a reason to purchase or attain this software so that you can help more patients. And then there's also a call to action for future research by looking at those secondary or safety outcomes and then powering for this, those outcomes and assessing them appropriately in future studies. But thank you for your time today. What questions do you have? If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of these journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.